this is another talk I've actually been really looking forward to. Uh, it hits on a project that I am going to start in the second half of this year, and so I'm just super excited, especially given the people we're presenting, which is Dan Hubbard, James Condon. Um, and I'll let them take it away, but this is looks awesome. Hello. Glad to be here. Thank you, everyone, for uh, staying attentive through this whole thing without looking at your laptops or your phones. Just kidding. Uh, so this is a practical guide to Kubernetes. Um, uh, Kubernetes, Kubernetes, Kates, whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over what Kubernetes is, but there's a lot of great resources online for that. Um, and I posted the presentation of PDF on a Slack channel with references. There's a lot of amazing information um, around Kubernetes. Uh, I'm Dan, this is James. We are people of interest, but maybe not interesting people. Um, and uh, let's get the show started. So the absolute best way to learn about Kubernetes is this engineer from Google made this video called The Children's Guide to Kubernetes, which is literally like a eight minute guide that he explained to kids about what Kubernetes is with little characters and everything. And it's actually got its life of its own. You can buy the characters. There's like Fibby, which is a web server. There's a container, so it's really cool. I recommend you look it up and learn everything you want about Kubernetes really quickly. The, the kind of Cliff Notes version is that Kubernetes is an orchestration system that sits on top of your containers. So if you don't use containers, you don't care about Kubernetes. That's one thing you need to know. So if your boss comes to you like, Kubernetes is hot. We need to do Kubernetes. You're like, yeah, we don't use containers. We don't care. It's that simple. If you use containers, Kubernetes is really freaking important. And it has become, or is becoming, the de facto standard. OpenStack, Mesos, everybody else is shifting over to Kubernetes. And it is now definitely the most popular train. And I would argue the most popular open source project in enterprise that's out there. Um, there's a lot of awesome things about it. Um, we, our company, we migrated off of Mesos uh, to Kubernetes. It took about 30 days for our entire uh, infrastructure to move. And we actually delegated a ton of source code out of, um, out, of our, uh, out of our project because it was built into Kubernetes. So a lot of the redundancy, auto-scaling, auto-provisioning, alerting, networking, storage, everything, it's all built in there. So it's, it's a fabulous thing. This is a high level, very high level architecture of Kubernetes. Essentially, there is the notion of a cluster. Um, a cluster has an API. Everything is driven by the API. Um, you can use a UI, it's up to you. You'll see why that's a good or a bad idea a little bit later. You have to use the API, and there's something called kubectl or cube control, which allows you to manage these things at scale. Um, there's a master, there's nodes, and then there's a notion of pods, which you have multiple nodes, which are essentially your containers. And then there's a registry that you pull down the things. I think the coolest thing about Kubernetes and you know, deploying into the cloud and all this stuff is it's kind of a reboot for security. Much like it is a reboot for deploying infrastructure, it's a reboot for security. And this is a time where we can kind of look back and go, what did we learn about what did we do wrong before? And then how do we do new things in this new world because everything is that different? So with that, I'm going to pass it on to James, and he's going to talk about uh, how you can get in trouble here. All right. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about risks and threats to Kubernetes. So. When we say risk, what we mean is there's certain types of deployments you might do or configurations you might set up that open you up for certain types of attacks that would come along. And then threats are the actual attacks themselves. The thing that's exciting about Kubernetes from a security perspective is this is still pretty new. And we haven't really documented all the different things that could happen here, but we have enough evidence of attackers going after Kubernetes deployments. The other thing I want to mention really quick, too, is there's a lot of ways to deploy Kubernetes, and there's a lot of managed services behind Kubernetes. So a lot of this will kind of depend on how you do it. So we're taking this from the stance of you're going to roll your own Kubernetes, you're going to administer it on your own, and roll from there. So first and foremost, you know, why do we care about the security of Kubernetes? Well, there's a lot of major reasons. You hear about in the news every day massive data leaks that are going on. Typically, these kind of come from like an unsecured MongoDB or things like that. But this is still a risk to an orchestration system that might be providing um, some of the data that you're going to store like that. The biggest one that we see in the wild right now is abuse of resources. So hijacking compute resources to do 
cryptocurrency mining, uh, things like that. We'll show a couple examples. Information disclosure. Uh, generally, if you're the owner of a Kubernetes cluster, you might not be too worried about information disclosure, but attackers profiling, trying to learn what your infrastructure is, some of those pieces of information are going to be very helpful to them. And then loss of service. So as anyone who's maintaining um, you know, a SaaS application, any downtime is not going to be good. It's very easy to, in these attacks, you know, cause damage, take things down. So when we talk about threats to Kubernetes, I think probably one of the easiest ways to kind of digest is you look at two sides. One is threats from outside of the cluster. So this is the open internet, or these are, are anonymous users, people who have access who shouldn't. And then you can also think on the other side of it is threats from inside the cluster, kind of like in the horror movies where it's like, you know, the call's coming from inside the house. If you have a pod that gets compromised, what's the blast radius of that? And that's where a lot of security practices we'll talk about later come in really handy. So from on the outside of the cluster, there's a few major components that can easily get exposed to unwanted intruders. Number one is your administration dashboard. The other is Kubernetes API service. Uh, one of the other ones is etcd, which is the data store for Kubernetes and then Kubelet, which is the API uh, for your nodes. And we're going to go through each and kind of talk about what can happen there. So you may have heard in the news recently, a uh, couple big names uh, were reported of having open administration consoles. So Redlock put a blog article about how they discovered dashboards for Tesla, Aviva, uh, Jim Alto. And the thing that all three of these kind of had in common is not only were these dashboards open to the internet, but they also contained uh, secrets into their cloud provider accounts like AWS, GCP. And then they also all had the same thing in common that they were running some sort of illicit coin mining operations going on. Um, which is kind of interesting because uh, you think that the attackers might take some of those secrets and then kind of move from there. but. Uh, that being aside, those are some of your risks that you're going to have. Weight Watchers was another one. You may or may not have heard about that one in the news, but there was a group uh, from Chromtech that discovered an open console. At first, they didn't know who it belonged to, but through these administration dashboards, they were able to look at the secret objects and then ultimately discover that there was a bunch of credentials associated with account that was associated with Weight Watchers. Um, it turned out that this was a dev environment, but just because it's a dev environment doesn't mean you don't have sensitive information and doesn't mean that that could roll over in a production environment. So last year we did our own research into this. We wanted to kind of figure out like, okay, how many open dashboards are there really out there? And by open dashboard, we mean something that you can touch on the internet. And we wanted to compare like how many of these are Kubernetes, how many of these are other orchestration platforms like Mesos, uh, Docker Swarm, things like that. And I'm going to show you how we did that. Just as a quick demo, you can see. So you can kind of reproduce this on your own if you'd like. But um, we use, hold on one second. So we use Shodan here. Um, I assume everyone's pretty familiar with Shodan. I don't know if anyone hasn't used Shodan, but I'll give you a quick rundown. Um, when we're looking in Shodan for open Kubernetes cluster or dashboards, the keyword that we end up using is Kubernetes master. You can see our search term up there. This is a search I did a couple minutes ago. Uh, we have over 20,000 results. Now, this search result, this doesn't necessarily mean there's 20,000 consoles that are open without a password on the internet. This just means that Shodan found 20,000 instances where in the banner metadata, they were able to pull out the keyword Kubernetes master. So as you go through the results, you can find, you know, there'll be a couple different quirks where it might not be associated, but this gives us kind of a rough idea of what we're dealing with. Um, if we were to take a closer look, we could actually, uh, since it's HTTPS, we could pull open a browser and actually hit it and see uh, what it looks like. And this is probably what you're most likely going to see. It's going to be password protected. Most modern versions are just going to have this baked in. 
Now, this is kind of where we draw the line of as far as we go when we're doing research. We're not actually going to start brute forcing passwords and logging in or doing anything like that. But this gives us an idea of kind of what we're looking at. Now, the other thing is we're not also going to go through and click through, you know, 20,000 results and see what each page loads. So what we can do is uh, Shodan has a command line uh, interface that you can use. And up here, it's cut off a little bit, and hopefully you can kind of see it. But what we can do is we can use uh, the CLI to download these files in bulk, and we get a huge file with all of our JSON metadata about every search result that we had. Uh, the CLI also provides a way to parse these. So we can parse out like IP and port. We can also put this in a CSV file. And then once we have those parsed out, what we can do is start crawling each one of these and take a screenshot of what we see. Um, so just as a quick little example, if I just look at uh, the top of one of these files, our Kubernetes master. What we see here is, you know, this is the first kind of hits that, that we get as we go through. So we're going to go through, crawl all those, and see what the results are. Okay, so as we started going through this, what we found in these screenshots is, hey, some of these are completely wide open. This is a couple screenshots from the actual research that we did. And you can see in these administration consoles, there's a lot that you can do. Um, you can see all of our different deployments, replica sets, daemon sets. We can shut down pods. We can deploy new pods. Pretty much it's like the easy mode of, of administering whatever you want to do. Now, some of our high-level findings. Um, when we did this, we saw about 21,000 internet-facing orchestration systems. And then of that, about 95% was on AWS. That doesn't mean that AWS is less secure. Some of it just means it's the most popular platform to run these on. And then the most interesting kind of one of the big takeaways here is 305 of them were identified without any password protection. And so that's just, you know, we talked about Tesla and some of those others. You know, there might be another handful or maybe 100 different other people associated that might have something like this going on. And then our biggest one that we saw, because we were also looking at Mesos Marathon and things like that, was Kubernetes, so 78%. Since we did this in July last year, I guarantee if we did this today, that that number would probably trend upwards a bit. OK, so moving on from the dashboards, uh, the Kubernetes API server. So this you know, really the heart and soul of Kubernetes cluster. This is, a, this is an area where, obviously, you don't want the API server exposed to the internet, but there's a number of authentication and authorization uh, mechanisms that are in place to kind of protect that if that happens. There's sometimes instances where people want to do this. But when you get a big CVE like this one that came out in December come along, uh, you kind of run into some issues. So at the core of this CVE, we kind of have two major issues with our API server. And the API server is going to be in charge of taking care of any authentication and authorizations to other endpoints you have in your cluster. Now, what ends up happening in this case is someone can issue a legitimate request and then try and upgrade to WebSockets, and then that keeps open a TCP connection. And then they can connect back and bypass future authorizations. So we see two major manifests of this. One is anonymous users can make service discovery requests to aggregate API servers. So there's two major ones, metrics and service catalog. And then what they can do from there, uh, TwistLock and Avic did two different POCs. In the, in the uh, TwistLock one, what we end up seeing is they create a discovery call request to metrics using anonymous user. There's not much that they can do on the metric server. They try and upgrade. They end up being able to go back in with a service account and leak a bunch of information on all pods and namespaces from metrics. 
Another major component that we have to protect is Kubelet. So Kubelet is the API endpoint for all of your nodes. It has authentication and authorization mechanisms as a part of it. But in our default configuration, and these screenshots come straight from uh, the Kubernetes documentation, is that they allow anonymous requests. So anonymous user is not going to get rejected. And then kind of the big one right here is that these authorization, the default set to always allow. So an anonymous user who's talking to Kubelet could ultimately um, have kind of free reign on what they want to do with their requests. When they design this, the, the idea is that the Kubelet is not going to be accessible by anyone but the API server, maybe some other components. But that's not always what ends up happening. So there's this really cool blog article written by a security engineer from Handy. And what they found is one of their coworkers had a Kubernetes cluster that was doing some uh, cryptocurrency mining. And they're trying to figure out how it happened. So as they were investigating this, the first thing that came up is they're like, well, our API servers exposed the internet, so maybe that's how they got in. But as they started to dig, dig deeper, what they found is well, the API server has proper authorization using certificates, so that's a little bit unlikely. But wait a second, our Kubelet API servers accidentally expose the internet, and HTTP and HTTPS endpoints are available. So even though those are available, what can you do as an anonymous user with authorization on always allow? Well, it's not clear in the documentation uh, for Kubernetes how you do this, but what they're able to do is come up with a proof of concept where you do a sequence of requests. You start with a post request with the command that you want on the pod that you're looking at, and then that gives you a redirect, and you can open up a WebSocket there, and that ends up getting executed. So what ended up happening is someone scanned, found that this was open, and then ultimately deployed a coin mining script that was running in their containers. Something else interesting that came in the news uh, this last year is, and this wasn't necessarily Cuba API being exposed to the internet, but as kind of some, some of the same similar themes there, is there was a server-side request forgery uh, in one of the services that Shopify was using, and a security researcher was able to find that by exploiting this, they were able to dump the Kubelet certificate and Kubelet private key uh, for this subsection of the deployment. And then they could actually replay those credentials to get root access into any of the pods that they wanted. So Kubelet can be very powerful. You need to make sure that it's not open. So etcd is, the, is an open source distributed key value store. And it's used as the backbone for Kubernetes. Uh, by default, it has no authentication. It does have the capability to do certificate authentication, uh, but it's meant to be deployed and only have the Q, uh, Kubernetes API server talk to it. And then the nice thing is it has a very, very easy to use REST and gRPC uh, APIs. So one of the things that we want to do is check out, like, okay, there's a bunch of exposed dashboards. Are there any etcd? Uh, servers, databases just kind of sitting out on the internet. So we go back to Shodan and uh, did this search earlier today. See that we see about 2,400 uh, of these via Shodan. Now, again, this doesn't necessarily mean that these uh, etcd databases are actually being used in a Kubernetes cluster, but when we took a closer look, we saw by the naming schemes that a lot of them were. Now, the scary thing about this is since this doesn't have authentication by default, anyone who can access it can just hit that REST API and start dumping what's in the database. So to show you an example of what that looks like, we didn't hit any of the IPs that we don't own, but we did go ahead and um, set up our own little honeypot to kind of see what would happen. So to show you how easy it is, this is just a curl command hitting this IP address. This is our etcd database. Um, and all we're doing here is dumping out all the keys that are inside of it. And what we end up getting back, this is what we set up. You can kind of see what, what we have here. But why this becomes so dangerous is uh, 
if you're in Kubernetes and you create a secret object, that's going to be stored in plain text in etcd by default. Um, it's going to be just base64 encoded. So another blog came out earlier in the year where a researcher kind of went through and started probing some of these etcds. And by like the third one, they found ones with you know credentials to different AWS accounts, other parts of people's Kubernetes clusters. So this is another very important piece of the puzzle uh, to get locked down. Okay, so we talked about these major um, attack vectors coming from outside of the cluster, mainly exposed APIs to people who they shouldn't be. Uh, the other side of the coin is when the threats are coming from within the cluster. So when a pod gets compromised, what can an attacker do? The nice thing about containers is that it's a sandbox environment, so this is a way to kind of contain the blast radius of what's happening. However, uh, sometimes things can go wrong. So how does a pod get compromised? Well, one of the biggest ones that you'll hear about is what happens to somebody who's just running any application that isn't necessarily in a container is application vulnerabilities. So think of, you know, uh, Apache server or Drupal or anything like that. Attacker is able to leverage known vulnerabilities, get on the system, you know, download malware, etc. cetera. Uh, the other is supply chain attacks. So last year, there were 17 different Docker images that were found to be backdoored on Docker Hub. Uh, that's another big, big area that you need to worry about. And then all the known and unknown CVEs that are out there, whether it's a CV in your application or a CV in uh, what's running your containers or your deployment itself. So suppose that you do get a pod that's compromised. Um, what happens from there? And this here will really illustrate why uh, things like RBAC and stuff like that's really important. But generally, if I compromise someone's pod, what I want to end up doing is I want to try and get access to the file system on the host that I'm running on. Now, there's a couple different ways to do this. Uh, doing like an actual container escape is very difficult, but there's a couple CVEs out there uh, that are older uh, that allow um, access to different volumes uh, that you're not supposed to. And then the other risk that you have is a privileged container in which the person can start accessing parts, like let's say um, you know, adding SSH keys or getting access to uh, password files, things like that. So that's how you can kind of move into the node the next thing that you worry about is movement in other places in the cluster. And I think probably your biggest uh, concern here is going to be overprivileged service accounts. So every pod is going to have a service account. If you're using a default service account, odds are it's going to be overprivileged. And if it is, then you can use that token and then start deploying new pods to the cluster, deleting, doing pretty much whatever you would like to do. The CVE that we talked about earlier, um, the second part of that, we talked about anonymous requests. There's another one where users who have access to uh, or who have authorization to do exec and attach and port forward commands can also use the CVE to uh, run future commands as an elevated user. But there's also, there could be, like this is provided that that account that they're using is not supposed to be doing those anyway. So that wraps up our portion on risks and threats all right well this is called a conference of defense so not, not offense so we thought we would also give you some tips um, before that the if you work for a company that does bug bounties for people that use showdown against your infrastructure just freaking buy showdown it's like 1500 bucks like I, I, there's this weird thing where people are paying ten thousand dollars to people they're saying you have an open kubernetes console it's like just buy showdown and do it yourself it's super cheap i think our licenses i don't know i don't think anyone's here from showdown that give pricing but i think it's like a thousand dollars or something it's super inexpensive and well worth it um, to do it yourself um and it's just driving bad behavior so uh, i would prefer that you do that 
Anyway, so uh, securing Kubernetes. So we've got uh, kind of 10 essentials. Why 10? Um, you know, five is too little and nine is an odd number. So 10 just seemed like a, a better way to come. And Dave Letterman, you know, top 10. Um, so I'm going to go over those. And uh, if anyone has any questions, you're operating a cluster, or have any other uh, suggestions, I, again, I, I posted all these onto the Slack channel. Um, so the first one is image scanning, or some people consider, you know, kind of in legacy, vulnerability scanning. Um, and this is really about how do I know what, what images or containers that I'm deploying don't have vulnerabilities within them. Um, and this is a little bit different than kind of your um, in, um, you know, runtime vulnerability stuff that you're probably doing today. This is about how do I scan the stuff before I deploy it? So, how, you know, where am I grabbing my images from? And then how do I know that they're not uh, vulnerable? And then combining that with what do I have that's deployed that has vulnerabilities that uh, may have come up before I deployed? Um, so that is super important. Uh, you also should scan for poor configurations in containers. You can scan for that, which is really cool. I mean, that's pretty hard to do in a number of other systems. But imagine in you know, kind of a legacy world where you could look at a, a, a machine before it gets deployed and see if it's got some bad config, like no admin password, and then you know, it gets deployed. You can do that here. You can look for keys. So look for keys within your containers that are hard-coded in there. Developers sometimes do weird things. They may hard-code keys somewhere in the container. You don't want that to happen. Um, and as I said, you want to combine uh, pre-deploy with, um, with runtime. Uh, I also would recommend um, your image repo is private. A lot of people are pulling public repos. Google, Docker, um, there's a way to get certified containers um, or set up your own private and pull from there and validate it and then go from there. Um, the next one um, James uh, talked about uh, real quickly is called uh, RBAC, or Rolled Bakes uh, Access Control. This is a relatively new feature in Kubernetes. It's kind of crazy. It wasn't there before. This just allows you to create divisional access to clusters, nodes, and namespaces in a, a, a way that allows you to um, diminish your kind of uh, attack spray or your, your threat surface. Um, so you can segregate your roles and permissions, and it's pretty easy to set up, and I think it may be default on now. I have to check what the latest one is. Um, a lot of things in Kubernetes are changing. It's a very, very fast-moving thing. Um, so if you're running Kubernetes, check and see if you have RBAC on. The next one is what I just put to the general security boundaries. Um, so within Kubernetes, there is a, a logical separation of something called namespaces. Think of this as like my network. And you know, there used to be a network with a DMZ. You know, my DMZ was like the heavily secured area, and it actually ended up just being where everything goes. Um, well, this your namespaces allow you to divide logically where work units should go. So for example, if I have a production uh, cluster, I should have a production namespace that nap maps to that because the namespaces are individual work units that you can secure on their own. Um, you can also utilize something called node pools uh, to separate your nodes, and um, you should separate sensitive workloads. Um, and really kind of think about what that means from a sensitive perspective. It's We always kind of go like, you know, these are the only sensitive things, and then a bunch of other stuff ends up over there. Um, or uh, the other thing to really think about is a lot of the breaches you hear about are actually R&D or testing or beta. And we don't need security there. Like production is where we secure everything. And it turns out a lot of the problems happen here and then end up over there in some way. Um, and a lot of the R&D is actually pretty important stuff. Like, hey, I'm, you know, this is just R&D. I'm just like doing DNA splicing with everyone's DNA. Well, that's probably important stuff. Um, the next one is upgrading. It's pretty important to upgrade. Um, as we know, the good news is it's way easier than upgrading in your current thing. Like upgrading is a pain in the ass. Like Patch Tuesday sucks. You have whole teams of people that are like, get ready for Patch Tuesday. Whoa, and we're going to sleep at work. Kubernetes, it's awesome. You upgrade all your machines, you tear down all the other ones, and you redeploy. It's like three commands. It's super, super simple, and it all just works. Like one thing I think about Kubernetes, it's like imagine in the old days walking in and like unplugging a server and then just laughing. Like you would never do that. You'd be crazy to do that. You can do that with Kubernetes. It just all continues working. That's why it's so popular. So there's no runtime patching. You really need to, um, to do it in a, in a proper CI CD way. Um, and it's also to know that vulnerabilities don't also mean you're vulnerable. So you may have a vulnerability somewhere, but you may not be vulnerable to it. 
like uh, you know, one of the problems with there was a really good um, paper I read recently, which took all the vulnerability scans across like ten different projects for the exact same code, and they all came up with different results. Like everyone came up with different vulnerabilities. So it's all about the context of your system. You know, for example, maybe there's a Python vulnerability, and you run Python, but it only works on Windows, and you're on Linux. Well, it's a vulnerability, but you're not vulnerable. Um, if you leave with just one thing out of the 10, this would be the number one thing I would say to go home with. There's something called pod security policies. Pod security policies are really powerful. It allows you to, to deploy essentially a configuration of security for all your pods and all your nodes from one central place. Um, they, it's a growing list of things, but they're really cool. You can say things like, this host can only talk to local host, or this host can only talk to this host or this host, no one can ever escalate to root, or this host will only run in read -only, with a read-only file system. So they're really powerful. They're deployed via YAML files, which may not be the prettiest thing in the world, but you can deploy them, and uh, they're super powerful. So learn about pod security policies. Um, node security uh, um, hardening. So nodes, you know, think of them as VMs. You see, you got these VMs out there. Um, you want to eliminate logins. Um, so you know, in a Kubernetes kind of container world, you really don't want developers logging into the boxes. That defeats a lot of the purpose. They shouldn't be SSHing to a box to see what's wrong with it. They can SSH to one of the other boxes, not in production, see what's wrong with it, and then fix it. That's not always as easy as it sounds, but you want to eliminate or mitigate logins. Um, you want to use read-only file systems. Um, it's pretty hard to get malware on a machine that's read-only. Try it. You know, it, it takes a much sophisticated, uh, much more sophisticated attacker to do something there. Um, so Core OS, for example, is read-only. Use Core OS. It's awesome. Um, or just deploy your containers as read-only. Um, you want to move towards least privilege, and I could spend two hours kind of talking about least privilege, but least privilege is something that's like really cool to say. It's really hard to do. Essentially what it means is that you want the minimal amount of privileges for, for your system, its access, and what developers can do on it as possible to mitigate all the security problems. So it's the Windows equivalent of get admin on your desktops because you have like an old IBM terminal app that needs it. Um, so get towards uh, least privilege. Consistent deployments. You know, make sure your deployments are consistent everywhere. It's a beautiful thing when you can go, when someone says, do we run X? And you're like, nope, or yes. And you can say it with just super confidence. I have a consistent deployment everywhere. This is what I know what my deployment looks like. And it's totally consistent because I deploy it all through the same mechanism. That's really hard to do in a lot of legacy application world. You're like, I, I don't know. I got to like sweep the network and find out what versions we have and what machines where. If you know people can't access the machines, well, you know what you're running. Um, there's something called atomic deployment validation and run is non-root. Um, audit logging. So there's two forms of audit logging that are really important. I'll talk about one at the end. This is about API audit logging. One of the really bad things about the CVE that James talked about that was most recent is it actually um, usurped the audit log. So like someone could access unauthenticated API requests and didn't get audited, which is like really, really bad. So, um, but assuming that that doesn't exist, there is an audit log which audits all of the API requests that are made. And really everything done in Kubernetes is via the API. If someone's doing something not via the, do, doing something not via the API, there's something really weird in your infrastructure or, or you're doing something really wrong. So that means you need to audit all of it. Um, you also should log as much as you could afford. You, you, there's always a time when you, oh, I wish we had those logs. Um, so look at Glacier or some you know, other you know, cold storage service where you can bring the logs back in some way. And if you're working in, in public cloud, there's a lot of those that are available. And, and they're pretty cheap nowadays. Um, and it's a big forensics fire hose that it, it's kind of like backups. Like backups are really awesome until you, you know, restore. And you're like, oh, yeah, that backup never really worked. Well, audit logs are kind of the same thing. You're like, wow, those audit logs are great, but I need to be able to query them. You know, just because I have the audit logs doesn't mean that I can query them. Um, there's also kind of this interesting new um, thing around compliance. And, you know, compliance was like one of the most boring things ever. Sorry, an auditor or in compliance, but it was like, oh, the auditors are here. And they usually do something that's totally relevant to what you do. Um, and they have a bunch of checks that are irrelevant to you. 
But real-time compliance and audit config become really, really important when infrastructure is code because things change really quickly. Um, and the developers can program all of this stuff really quickly. And what that means is typically most of the problems that we see are config and audit changes that have been made. They just didn't know. So the ability to look at those in real time is really important. It's not a semi-annual, monthly. It's like an hourly or, or you know, real-time thing where you're looking at all your configurations. And one of the good things to look at is the CIS benchmarks, which is a good set of things to look at. Whether you're, there's one for Kubernetes specifically, there's one for GCP, there's one for AWS, there's one for even Azure, um, where you can look at all your configs and decide whether or not you're failing or passing um, kind of known audits. It's also a really nice report you can give to your audits, auditors and go, hey, we're pretty good. We're PCI based off of this report. And they're like, oh, that's really cool. Um, Post audit um, logging. Um, so there's some great tools, OSSEC, OS Query. Um, of course, there, there's vendor tools available, but the reason why I believe this is really important is because it's becoming very, very hard to collect telemetry in the network. Um, you know, it's all encrypted now, or hopefully it's all encrypted. Like I say, like a big signal is if you see unencrypted traffic in your data center, that's a probably bad that's going on, um, or you haven't deployed properly. Um, so most of the traffic's encrypted. You can really only see kind of the five tuples of source, dest, and ports. Um, and, and sometimes ports may be masked in some way. So it's becoming really hard. Not only that, in Kubernetes, there's service meshes that get created where it all goes over a VPN. So it's all IPsec on top, and then you got SSL below, and TLS and all these other encryption protocols. So breaking that apart is just very difficult for most, <laughs> most people, minus maybe some governments. Um, so the network is becoming less of a good signal than it was in the past. Furthermore, the workloads are ephemeral. So like your workload that was there an hour ago is moved and is gone. So if you're just looking at network traffic and you see two IP addresses, well, what were those IPs? I don't know. The machines are completely blown up and I've got a whole new machine that's, you know, didn't exist an hour ago. So uh, the ability to log and audit the things on the machines themselves becomes more and more important. Um, you know, remember like, I don't know how long ago, it was like five years ago, you could ask someone like, What's the IP address of your web server? And they knew it. Like, what's the IP address of your mail server, your web server? Be like, oh, it's like 213. Now it's like, I don't know. I don't even know how many I have. Like, how busy is it? And, you know, I may have 10, I may have 2,000. I don't really even know. There's no, like, physical thing. I don't look in the data center anymore. Um, you also, uh, with, with, uh, with an agent, of course, you can correlate all your indicators. Um, there's a lot of, as I said, a lot of great uh, options for this. Um, Linux obviously has a lot of really good tools. Watch slash proc. Audit D is really good. Um, if you can if you can create PCAPs and look at other signals in there, um, Linux auditing is way better than Windows. I, I don't want to build a religious debate here, but there's a lot. Like almost everything is audited. Everything in slash proc existed at some point. It's really hard to circumvent that um, in some way, and it's in the kernel, so it, it gets uh, difficult. Um, the last one is, um, you know, the security people need to get, or sorry, let's talk about developers first. So one of the big issues here is that the developers are becoming one of the weakest links. So you do all the security and everything else, you're like, oh my God, we, we have keys, we rotate keys, they're on the machines, everything else. And then you got a developer that's got a laptop with no password on it. And, you know, someone owns their laptop and they've got complete access to everything. Um, so the security, or the developers, because they are becoming the people that are building all this stuff, and quite frankly, they're becoming your best friend because they're gonna fix everything you say that's wrong, um, are becoming really, really important to understand what are the security implications of what they're doing. But I would say the other is actually more true. The security people actually become, need to become more developer-centric and more developer-friendly. In fact, I would argue that developers are way more security-savvy then security people are a lot more developer savvy. Um, and I think that's great. And there's a lot of really good things here. But you got to learn how people are building, deploying, what the application looks like. How does it operate? Why do they do these things? And it's all about visibility. If you start getting visibility, it's really good. You're not going to be able to sit in between someone, tell a developer not to deploy a certain way. You know, you got to just you know, start walking with this. Um, and I think we're kind of in between this, like, you know, old school, like, the firewall is everything world and, like, you know, immutable for everybody and least privileged. It's just not realistic um, to, to, to go to everyone and say you're going to do this. 
So um, I would say, you know, level up in some of these key areas if you are using technologies like Kubernetes, Docker, um, and of course, uh, anything public cloud. Um, so that's it, that's my email, that's James' email. We're on the internet, you can find us. Otherwise, anyone have any questions? I will buy 10 dozen donuts if someone has a good question for breakfast tomorrow. All right. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yes. So immutable is, is a key tenant of, of deploying, which, you know, essentially is you can tear down stuff without anything being affected, and you have a consistent deployment with uh, the ability to know what is running at any time, uh, uh, you know, from any place. Um, and the most important is that people aren't basically messing with systems in runtime. You know, that's, that's like the non, you know, verbose Wikipedia version of it. Um, and uh, it turns out that, you know, modern developers want to work this way. Um, they don't want to log into machines. They don't want to look at them. And once you get to that place, it's really, really good from security. And, you know, I, 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 some reporter called me recently. I'm doing this article on why, like, Docker and Kubernetes are the biggest security problem in history. And, you know, this is going to be crazy and the world's going to fall apart. And I was like, well, actually, I don't think that's really true. If we get this right, this is way more secure than where we are coming from. It's just we got to figure out, you know, what that middle ground is in between now and when you get to least privilege and immutable and all these other things. But certainly these things are built way more robust than, you know, deploying Windows boxes all over the place with, you know, a firewall and a DMZ that doesn't really exist. Every time. Every time. So, like, the, so the, 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 I would say the brand equity of security companies with developers is like down here. Um, it's in my way. You make me go too slow. What the hell's a change control? Um, well, I, I would say don't shove a traditional tool into the cloud. Don't cloud wash, would be one. Like, hey, my firewall can be virtualized and you can deploy it in the cloud. No. Um, my antivirus works just as well on Linux as it does on Windows. Nope. Um, uh, be very, very uh, careful of being in line. Um, it's more about detect than prevent. Um, it's more about orchestration and automation than it is about how do, how do I kill packets and stop things from running. Um, uh, what else? I don't know what other common what other common security things people yell at. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great. Uh, just for the for the video, the suggestion was, to, you know, give code examples instead of telling, or or you know, or or walk through, and that's why. Kind of get, getting up to the development side is really important. Um, no, not a lot of them actually. Um, it depends on which. Well, it depends on how it was designed. I mean, a lot of people right now are on the journey to Kubernetes. So this is like a really good time there. You know, we, we meet kind of three different types of, of customers. There's like ones that are fully Kubernetes. There's so ones that are like in the midst of deploying. There are ones that are like, I think we need to do this, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so obviously the earlier <laughs> that, that you can start recommending these, the better. But yeah, certainly you don't want to come in with a, you know, a fist of like, here's what you have to do developers or we're shutting down. You know, I'm telling the CEO, we're not secure. You have to do it, baby step into it. Um, but I found that developers with these types of things are super uh, welcoming to do this. They're like, oh, this sounds awesome. Yeah, how can we work together and do it? Um, back to the code example, um, anytime you can give a cause and effect, like here's like the example of a POC we saw online where you know, a company was compromised. Oh, and by the way, here's the code that helps you fix that particular thing. That's really good. But what we're seeing is like Slack is the new SIM. Um, you know, uh, there's a Slack channel, 
Um, you're on the Slack channel. You, uh, you're sitting there, and you notice something bad going on, and you actually, as a security person, don't even have access to fix it. So your best friend is the security person, or sorry, the developer, and you need to ask the developer, hey, how do you, do you know about X, Y, and Z? And without visibility, you can't ask smart questions. So asking dumb questions just annoys people, right? And you're like, hey, does anyone use AWS? <laughs> like, does anyone use S3? Like those are just not good questions, but it's like, hey Dave, I noticed last night at midnight you you know opened a new S3 bucket with this content in it, you know with this API. Did you mean to do that? And Dave would be like, oh man, no, I'm in vacation, uh, and there's something really bad going on there. Um, so just kind of talking the talk, I think, and understanding is good. Um, but they're they're certainly open to uh, to making changes and fixes. Yeah. 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 So the suggestion is more examples. You know, real world things that have happened. I, I think are great. Um, also, kind of doing it yourself sometimes is cool. You know, hey, I noticed that we're on Showdown. You know, <laughs> that doesn't seem like a good thing. That our, you know, you can get to our management server. You know, from there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the question was, why do we go from Mesos to Kubernetes? Um, the number one was, we were finding ourselves to be in the business of things we didn't think we needed to be in the business of. So we were writing custom things for how do we deploy, custom things for auto scaling, custom things for redundancy, custom things for failover that we didn't want necessarily to lock into a vendor or a, a cloud service provider on, and they're all built into Kubernetes. Um, also, just the train, like if you watch the commits across both, they're growing at just a totally different rate. So, um, like, there's no managed Mesos option within AKS or within Azure uh, GCP or Google. Um, and Mesos now is, is transitioning over to a Kubernetes story. Um, so it's just mostly momentum in, in projects. And, and if you ever want to get a glimpse of Kubernetes and um, what's happening there, um, a really good conference is called KubeCon. Um, it sells out really quick. Um, it was in Seattle this year. Um, next year, it's in San Diego. Go San Diego. Um, and it's an awesome conference. It's a good place to meet developers and hear about security stuff that are new things that are happening. Um, and uh, I would say it's, it's uh, arguably almost better than DockerCon now. It's got a, a good set of stuff. Uh, but it sells out really quick, so check it out. Yeah, so, so the question is, is there like a service or a product or an open source thing that I can use to test my, uh, to do pen testing? Um, the answer is yes. There's a number of them that are out there and there's a number of services that are doing it. Um, there's a, a good one, a uh, plug to Rhino Security Labs, um, like Rhino, like Rhinoceros Security. Um, they have one specifically for AWS um, that uh, will allow, th think of it as um, Metasploit for AWS. So you can actually run it. There's different modules you can run, and you can test things. So there is a growing number of security tools that are out there. Um, if you ping me on Slack, I'll send you a few few links around. But the answer is there is not a hardware piece of hardware you can buy to do this. That's not really the way it works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Since we're talking to them, I don't know if Jose ended up coming, but um, he was supposed to come. 
No. So the question is, can you label? So Kubernetes does have an artifact called a label. Think of it as a tag. The tags are things that you're tagging your workloads from, but they're not exposed, obviously. Yeah. It is. Yeah, they come and go really, really fast. Like, you couldn't really report to Google this IP address had this problem, you know, at this time, it just, the, the information is really hard. Now, most of it's natted um, in some way. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you think of it, it's actually gonna get worse because service meshes are gonna change the way that all the routing happens inter, inter cluster. So you may have a service mesh where like your cluster is virtual, where you have like a set of nodes in like AWS West and then one in like GCP Asia. And all that traffic is going to be going over the internet. And it's all going to be encrypted in a way no one can look at. And there's IPs that are terrestrial. Like, it's going to get really hard. Um, so I don't have a good answer for that. I think, um, obviously, when you have an, uh, something on the machine itself, the, the, the person knows, but the provider. Um, I think we're, going, we're moving to a bit of a different uh, operating model, for sure. Um, you know, I, I think it's going to be a combination of, like, the cloud service provider. You know, they have a responsibility. And I think it's a little bit more than just fix the hypervisor and physical security. Um, open source, there's so much open source out there. I mean, there's so many, uh, you know, like the Capital One project, there's like 50 of those now. Like every morning I seem to wake up, there's a new open source project. There's a ton of great open source stuff. And then if you want a vendor or a service, and it's about those kind of operating together in a way that can hopefully get all this stuff together. But it's super early in that. And I think forensics is gonna be hard. Yep. If you're just looking at IPs, then that's not going to be the most accurate way, even just with the gray log stuff. I just think about like, well, those IPs, they're coming and going. They're different all the time. I don't know how, how, uh, how accurate that kind of point in time is. Over time, it's probably pretty good. Yep. Yes. Uh, we don't share them. You mean like share our pod security policies? I'm not sure that would be a good idea, but <laughs> they're pretty simple. The pod security policies are pretty simple. There's not a lot you could do right now. Um, I can tell you the one that we use religiously is um, no escalation and read only. Those are two that we use across every every machine, every, v, or every VM, every node, everywhere. Um, we don't do service meshes yet. It's still pretty new. Um, I don't know if... Anyone else? Any other? Do you have any other? You have a big Kubernetes shop, Capital One. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're also really careful, like, on what images can run. Like, if you think of it, containers are so different in that, you know, imagine if in the legacy, if you just allowed anyone to buy a server, put it in a rack, and install whatever they wanted on it. That's kind of what it is. You just go get a container that includes bits that run as, you know, a machine, you know, with, with applications and everything else in it. So you got to make sure that's consistently um, understood. Um, and a lot of the times you run in this gap between, oh, I'm just doing research or about to deploy. And we all know what happens with that. Well, the research cluster becomes the cluster. Yeah. 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 Well, may maybe we could start like a side Slack channel, like Kubernetes security policies, and we could you know, do a discussion group on that. Like, what is your web tier versus, you know, back end, you know, tier, whatever. Um, I connect. Great, I think that's all we have. I'll bring donuts tomorrow. Assuming I can find them. Someone said they have good donuts here. Red rock donuts. Round rock donuts. All right. All right, thank you.